All right, we're live on Facebook, on Bronx River Alliance Facebook. Thank y'all for uh, those that are tuning in and will be tuning in in a minute. Um, we, are, uh, we are introducing and acknowledging our elders, a weekly plant chat, and my name is Nathan Hunter. I'm with the Bronx River Alliance and the Bronx River Foodway, and I'm excited to be with Journey Bimwala. Hey guys, I'm Journey Bimwala. Um, I am co-chair of the Foodway, part of Concrete Friends, and I'm also a forager and clinical herbalist and educator. So welcome guys, we're looking forward to connecting with you guys today. <laughs> and of course our star today, Christian Murphy. Christian, welcome to Acknowledging Our Elders. Um, would love for you just to kind of introduce yourself uh, to the audience. Thanks Nathan, yeah, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, my name is Christian Murphy. I'm the Ecology Coordinator for the Bronx River Alliance. A big part of what I do here is to introduce people to the river um, and to data collection so that we can actually study the river's health and see what it is that we need to do um, to get the ecosystem back on track and able to support the incredible diversity that um, this landscape used to support a long time ago. Um, and just to help people to fall in love with the river the same way that I do every day. Oh so, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, Christian. And I'm lucky enough to work alongside you. Um, and I'm happy you joined us today. And I know, you know, outside of work, you're just as much interested in the same work topics, right? Like plants and our ecosystems and how they're doing. You're an avid birder. Um, and we often gap about plants. And today you are, are going to introduce us to one of the plants that has kept you rooted or grounded um, for some time now. And I'm just gonna screen share so we have some imagery and we can learn its name together. So just give me one moment, but yeah, we're gonna click on the next. Here we go. And we're looking at our Facebook Live. Here we go. So Christian, tell us about the plant you've chosen. <laughs> so I chose to talk today about the common blue violet, Viola sororia. Um, so this is a pretty little flower. It's a wild um, native plant. It grows across New York City and across the eastern United States. Um, it's very sweet. It comes up in early spring. So when you're walking through um, any of our urban parks or even if you ever take a trip up to the actual um, wild landscapes that we have here, um, like Bear Mountain State Park, north of the city, um, you will see this plant start to appear in March, um, sometimes April. Uh, depending on the sort of weather in a particular year. Um, it's a very sweet plant, um, very low to the ground, um, but often can blanket. So you might see one or two, or you might see like 5,000. So that's kind of what I love about this plant is that it kind of just does whatever it wants to do um, wherever it is, and it's very resilient. Um, and so some people actually kind of sometimes consider it a weed because it is kind of hard to get rid of if you're trying to plant different plants in a space. And it's kind of like, no, I'm here and I'm here to stay. Um, but it really just goes to show that this plant um, is very resilient, uh, is able to adapt to a lot of different habitats and landscapes, but is native to moist woodlands in the eastern United States. Um, so we definitely see a lot of them along the Bronx River, definitely see a lot of them um, in sort of grassy wooded edges um, in the northeast United States. That's just sort of a quick overview. <laughs> that was that was spot on. Thank you so much, Christian. And you can find these living by the chives at the Foodway, kind of in the center, um, where I know some people in particular, they, they seek out violas uh, or violets. So Christian, why did you choose, uh, you know, the common blue violet as the plant to highlight? I have to credit my mom for me sort of falling in love with this plant. Um, so this goes actually, this goes way back like 20 years or so. Um, but she's originally from England and she's always loved violets. They have very similar species in the UK to this one. Um, and she just loves the purple color. And so maybe about 10 years ago, she poached some from Central Park. Shh, don't tell. <laughs> she grabbed them, put them in a bag. She went home and she planted them on our balcony at home. And in the hopes that they would come back next year and bloom. And they definitely came back, but they did not bloom. Um, and year after year, the plant would reemerge from the plant pot that she put them in. Um, you know, nice thick green leaves, but no flowers. 
And we just kind of resigned to the fact that we just don't get enough sunlight or maybe our potting soil wasn't very good quality. Um, and so the plant just didn't have what it needed to grow the flowers. Um, and, you know, we kind of just assumed that that's what we get for stealing <laughs> um, or foraging, as maybe we should say, because these are native plants and they were wild in the park. They definitely weren't planted. Um, so let's fast forward to 2019. Uh, my mom falls and she breaks her wrist. And in doing so, she discovers that she has osteoporosis. Um, she's in a lot of pain. She can't do her job very well. She's a nurse at Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, and so she actually had to take a lot of medical leave. Um, this is around Christmas time, 2019. Um, so this is a really lousy time of year to have something like this happen. Um, it was very stressful. And of course, we know the next thing that happened really in all of our lives was the pandemic. And so even though she was a nurse, and even though um, hospitals were really desperate for the support, um, they wouldn't take her back. They just didn't think she was fit to work. They thought she might be a liability. Um, and then her um, medical leave was starting to run out. And so we were literally looking at not having a paycheck to support a family of four, um, which was a really, really, really challenging time in our lives. Um, and finally, um, we got a letter from the hospital saying so they would take her back. This is probably last week of March, early April. Um, and it was a huge, huge relief. I mean, it was like the entire weight of the world was lifted off of our shoulders. And I remember going out onto our balcony just for a breath of fresh air after having you know, been stressed out about this for so long and just casually looked down and saw that for the first time in about eight years, um, my mother's violets had bloomed. And that was the day that they'd actually pushed out some flowers and the petals had opened. Um, and I just remember feeling such a profound sense of, I don't even know how to describe that moment of just seeing her flowers open after getting such an answer that we've been looking for for weeks. Um, and it just, it's always stuck with me. Um, and that spring when we were all in quarantine, um, one of the things that I chose to do was to just walk around the city. It was a safe thing to do. Um, very socially distant, lots of fresh air. Um, and I really noticed that you can find this plant all across New York City. Um, it grows out of <laughs> the pavements, it grows out of sidewalks. Um, it's in all of our parks. You can find it growing out of like stone staircases sometimes. Um, so it really just kind of opened my eyes to um, just how widespread this plant is. And to me in that moment and in that spring of such uh, trepidation and fear and instability and insecurity. It was just a really welcome sign. I felt like the plant was sort of keeping me grounded and reminding me that the world is still beautiful and that you can still get answers to difficult questions. Um, it may just take some time and patience, just like the plant took a long time to actually bloom for us. Um, and it you know, just kind of set me on the path of being a, a naturalist. And now it's kind of a hobby that I do recreationally in my free time. Yeah. Oh. That's such a beautiful and like really striking story. Um, and you shared with us some images of the plant that's that's flowered, um, including, you know, the part where you mentioned some of these these, you know, plants thriving from stone steps and things. Yeah. So this image on the right, that is our balcony at home. Those are our <laughs> our funky little violets when they finally bloomed. So yeah, this was like a really just exciting story. And, um, you know, and you continue to like connect with this plant, you know, quite literally, because it's living, you know, at your parents' place. Um, but are there other ways that you've been connecting with, you know, violets? Um, or are there ways that you would encourage, you know, others to kind of start to engage or connect with the, with the violet? Yeah, so um, I did some digging. Once the plant opened and it became... <laughs> such an important part of my life, I decided to learn as much as I could about it. And lo and behold, it is edible, which is so much fun. So I went and I made a small salad from our plants on the balcony um, and I ate them and it was so much fun to just be able to forage right from my own house. Um, so this plant is totally edible. I'm pretty sure all parts of the plant are edible. It's not toxic. Um, the best time to eat the young leaves are when they first come up before they get too sort of tough. 
um, later on in the season. And the flowers are edible too. Um, the plant is pretty high in vitamin C and some other vitamins. Um, and so a fun thing that I like to do when I see a fresh violet and I trust the location where I find it is to actually pick it um, and eat it raw, just to sort of taste the flavor of a fresh plant um, and you know recognize that it is full of nutrients. Um, but you can also do some other things with the plant too. And I have never you know, adventured or experimented with different ways of preparing it. But traditionally, um, people use the flowers to make jellies and candies. Um, and so you can definitely do some kind of mixture with it and add some sugar. Um, and not only do you get like a sweet treat, but also you get this beautiful, beautiful purple color uh, to whatever it is that you've created. So you can put that on toast. You can, you know, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, I've heard that the flowers can be used to um, sort of decorate cakes. So you can crystallize them in sugar um, and they can be used as a beautiful decoration for desserts and stuff like that. Um, or, you know, you could just make a salad. <laughs> I think the easiest thing to do is to just trim the leaves and eat them like you would a dandelion salad. Um, I believe you can also use the plant to make a tincture um, or some kind of tea. Um, so there are properties that do soothe, um, you know, some soreness. And I think Journey was telling me recently that the plant can be used, especially after a harsh winter, to sort of soothe your throat, soothe your body as you're coming out of, you know, maybe having colds or other kind of illnesses during the winter time as you get ready for spring. Journey, do you want to build on that or kind of? I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes, this plant is, it's, 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 it's a beautiful plant. When you come out of the, the harsh winter and you have that dryness, that dry cough, and you're still trying to get things out of your system, um, it welcomes us into the spring. So you can use it for that, for um, a dry cough, a sore throat, um, make tea, like Christian mentioned, and then just enjoy it that way. Even just eating the salad, right? Eating, eating it as a salad will also work because it has this coolness. Um, it has, I don't know if you ever felt it, Christian, when you touch the, the, the leaves, right? It also always has this coolness thing to it and which kind of lets you know it's cool. It's a cooling plant. So if you're hot, right, if you're heated, it's definitely going to help to cool the body and help the sore throat, the dryness of it. Love it. Yeah, it's got that great texture, right? Really, it's, the leaves are thick and juicy. Like it's, it's a really nice plant to just touch, you know? <laughs> it's so inviting. Yeah, and I think about it too when I when we think about a food forest and like layers. Um, this is a really great ground cover layer. So when you don't want to weed a lot, you know, to transplant these guys maybe from a space from that you know of, um, you know, and kind of like fill in an area that you have some pesky weeds that won't go away. So I know we've been really trying to let them naturalize, and like you said, you know, they really fill in an area. So, um, but because they are so low to the ground, we talked about this the other day you know, you want to be wary of contaminants that could possibly run on the leaves or um, impact the plant in other ways. So yeah, you definitely want to know the health of the soil before you're, you're diving into to spaces. And just a reminder, it's technically illegal to forage on public lands. The foodway is an exception to the rule. And we encourage you to come out um, in March when the, when the park opens back up. Speaking of yeah. soil, um, Nathan, well, if you don't know, because we're going to be doing um, soil testing yes. um, soon. So that will be a good time to, if you want to know, um, the, you know, what's actually in the soil that some of the plants are growing in, you will be able to bring them to the Foodway um, Concrete Plant Park and get it tested to really see what's, what's going on there and to ensure that the plant, right? Um, that you're looking at or that you are doing things with, um, it's, it's okay, it's healthy. I also wanna point out one thing. Um, if you guys, Nathan, if you go back and you show us the leaf of the plant again, mm -hmm. the shape of the leaf, yes. Cause there are, other, there are other plants out there that will look like the violet, the blue violet. 
and the leaves are different. So knowing the shape of the leaf by right, that heart shape and the fact that and the amount of petals that's with the flower can help you to identify it. So to make sure that you don't grab the wrong one, a look alike, the flowers is purple or blue. So you're thinking, hey, you know, this might be the plant that they were talking about, but you wanna make sure that everything match, right? The leaves, um, the, 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 the shape of the flowers or the number of it. So everything that's on, that you guys are actually looking at, you wanna make sure that the plant you're looking at has those characteristics. If they don't, right? If you're not sure, that's one thing with, with any plants that you're looking at, you have interest with, whether you go to the store or not, if it doesn't meet all of the criteria and you're not sure, don't do it. <laughs> do a little bit more research and then. Definitely, that's great advice. And I, I also, I, I just highlight the roots, you know, often on the surface, they seem like a lookalike. Uh, or they, you know, you kind of have this issue with lookalike and then you, you uproot it. You actually dig up the plant. You'll look at the root system. They're completely different. I think this plant really tripped me up. I saw some garlic mustard the other day and I, I saw the leaves and I was like, oh, this looks like baby garlic mustard. But um, the roots of garlic mustard, I think they're little nodes, like little nodules uh, versus this, which is rhizomes. Uh, it's more rhizomatic. So uh, yeah, that's another thing is you can, you know, especially for a plant that's in abundance like this, where it's not a scarcity issue, um, you can dig it up and actually inspect it a little further. And that's a great way, um, like Journey's saying. But yeah. Yeah. There's also um, an invasive species called the lesser celandine, which comes up around the same time in spring, also low to the ground. And when they don't have flowers, if you see it from a distance, you might mistake the lesser celandine for a violet. Um, so yeah, that leaf shape, the root structure is really important for distinguishing even just between two early spring plants like this. Definitely. Yeah, succulent leaves, low to the ground. The lesser celadine, I also used to talk with volunteers. We used to call them wild buttercups uh, because people thought they were buttercups. Uh, they are not buttercups. They are an invasive plant. And most likely, if you're finding it along the Bronx River, it is lesser celadine, not one of the native species. But iNaturalist is a great app uh, to further your knowledge around these things. So uh, I just want to kind of like open up the space to those that are reviewing. We've got some viewers right now. Thank you for watching. And I invite you to uh, offer any questions um, or thoughts about your interactions with blue violets. Um, maybe you know something about the blue violet you want to bring into this space. Um, and wow, since there is a delay in this communication, uh, I'm wondering, Christian, if you have any last like comments or thoughts about the blue violet or journey? Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, I can sort of expose myself as the massive nerd that I am. But um, I, when I realized how abundant this plant is, even in the urban landscape, you know, not even just within um, you know, our carefully manicured parks of the Bronx River. I mean, we put a lot of effort into the green spaces on the Bronx River to try to pull that ecosystem back. But this plant doesn't really need that as much. It's one of those plants that's kind of like, okay, well, I'll go find my own spot to sit and thrive. And so I started to document it being the scientist that I am. And it really just kind of opened up this world of like, oh, you know, there's ecosystems that exist across just Manhattan alone, you know, let alone the entire city. Um, and so I would just go and as I'd walk around and find these things, I'd, I'd drop little pins on Google Maps. Um, I don't know if you can see, I try to, so <laughs> those are all flowers that I wanted to remember where they were. Um, That's perfect, Christian, we can see it. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, every, I mean, literally everywhere, like, I'm not even kidding, like you can see I'm dropping pins all over the city. So, um, you know, I just, the plants are my friends. I, I see them as um, things that greet me at different times of year. They do remind me of really important things in my life, like my mother, um, my love very dearly, um, and just the, you know, the symbolic nature of what flowers represent to us. Um, so personally, one of the things that I've done on this journey of being a naturalist is to sort of memorialize these plants. So every year with my pins, I now get to go back and revisit um, revisit these flowers when they come up and it's something that I look forward to every year um, just 
putting that out there that if you want to interact with plants in a kind of unique way, you can <laughs> you can do that and you can submit them to the iNaturalist app, as Nathan was saying. Um, it's a resource that folks like us use, but it's also a resource that researchers and um, scientists use as well. Um, so you're also helping the larger sort of scientific community um, by nerding out the way I do. Thank you, Christian. Um, that was really great. I love everything that you said and the connection part, you know, like seeing the, 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 these plants as your friend and, you know, visiting them and, you know, you have it in your thing with all the places that they are and the connection, because it's like, you know, you guys built, you're building a relationship. There's, there's a connection there and a need, right? Because it's like, okay, well, where are they all over the place? So like, if I can't find one here, I can connect with one to the other side. And that's really like what, what we're doing, what it's all about, right? That connection, right? We want to acknowledge our elders. We also want to connect with them because by connection and building that sort of relationship, there is an understanding that comes with it. There's also a sense of respect that grows from it. Whereas regardless of where you see the plant, right? Whether it's coming through the concrete on the side of the thing or in the park, you know, it warms your heart up and you know that it's not, although they will be quoted as invasive, so on and so forth, but you won't look at them that way. You know, and I think that's that's really important because when it comes to even healing, right? You don't always have to ingest a plant. You know, just simply being around them, just simply seeing them because the colors, if it's a plant that has a scent, their scent, their presence, all of that stuff can just warm you up and make you feel better when you don't feel um, better about whatever's going on with your day. And I like that you brought that up because it highlights just that, you know, it, it's there's so many different ways you can you can utilize a plant, approach a plant, get to know a plant. So thank you for that. Of course. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I think of it like an address book, you know, and you're revisiting mm -hmm. your friends and keeping in tabs, making sure they're okay. Um, a bit of mutual aid kind of situation going on. Um, but uh, yeah, this has just been a really exciting conversation. I think it, 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 for me personally, it has me looking forward to spring even more um, as these are some of our first spring ephemerals. So um, yeah, we're excited to welcome the common blue violet back to Concrete Plant Park. And uh, you can connect with Christian um, at the Bronx River Alliance uh, where he is running our ecology program um, and runs the ecology team with his co-chair. And yeah, we're just, uh, we'll be back here next Thursday to connect again. We're actually gonna be connecting with Journeys daughter Maya, uh, who will be highlighting and featuring her favorite plant, lemon balm. So we're excited, uh, excited for that next talk, but we're really grateful for the time, Christian. And uh, yeah, continue. We'll see you throughout the season, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye. Bye. See ya.